Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 21 to 24, and then verses 35 to 43. It's the Gospel for the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B. I shall only read part of it because it's a long passage. St. Mark writes, When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials, named Jairus, came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please, come lay your hands on her, that she may get well again. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, Jesus put them all out, and he took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child of twelve, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. That's from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, and verses 35 to 43, at least part of the passage. Well, what does it suggest to us? Well, let me begin this way. Whatever be the academic discussion over, say, the date and place of Zoroaster's birth, there is no doubting his significance as a religious founder, the founder of Zoroastrianism. The religion that issued from his life and teaching exists to this day. And Muhammad's influence in history was extraordinary. The same can be said of Buddha. They lived and died and their influence continues in the powerful religious traditions and teachings they initiated. However, no one would claim that, say, Zoroaster himself is alive and in unseen manner is being encountered in the practice of his religion. The Zoroastrian would not claim that he interacts with the living unseen Zoroaster himself, except perhaps in a metaphorical sense. He does not think that in a literal sense the living person of Zoroaster is continuing to do what he once did several centuries before Christ. Nor would the Muslim claim that it is Muhammad himself that he is encountering in his practice of Islam. No, Muhammad was, he believes, the prophet who pointed to Allah and whose teaching continues to point to Allah long after he himself died. Muhammad is gone, but his message is fully alive and well, he thinks. But the case is radically different with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not just a very great religious founder who lived and died and whose teaching continues to inspire countless numbers of devotees. No, in the practice of the Christian religion one encounters the living unseen Jesus himself. He is the direct object of the Christian religion. Just as he engaged with others in his life, death and resurrection, bringing to them the divine life he had come to offer, so, he continues to bring man this same eternal life he won for us. It is he whom we literally encounter in the practice of the Christian religion. We do not just follow a teaching, however unique and efficacious this teaching is for salvation. We become deeply involved with the living Jesus. He himself intervenes in our life and dispenses what he gained for us in his life and death. He does this especially in the sacraments. I'd like to speak about this briefly. In our Gospel today, Christ is asked to heal a dying girl. He goes to the house and raises her from death. This, together with other miracles he effected, was a sign of the spiritual resurrection he had come to offer man. He had come to take away the sin of the world, to break the power of sin and to replace it with holiness. Having risen from the dead, 
He now does for our souls what he then commonly did for men's bodies. And he does this within the life of the church, and in particular, in and through the sacraments. When a priest brings the sacrament of the anointing of the sick and holy viaticum to a very sick person, one like the girl in our gospel today, it is Christ himself who is being led to the sick person. He is on his way to her in the person of the ordained priest. He is present in the priest himself by virtue of the priest's baptism and priestly ordination, which are two of the seven sacraments. He is also present and active in the sacraments which the priest brings to the sick person. In those sacraments, Christ, holy and in his full reality present, though unseen, ministers to the sick person, just as he once did when he walked this earth. In the anointing of the sick, Christ comes to the sick person and abides with him to help him remain deeply united to God in his sickness. And when the priest hears the sick person's confession, it is the unseen Christ who is doing this and forgiving him his sins. The priest is Christ's representative and instrument by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders. And what he is doing is what Christ commanded his apostles to do on the evening of the day he rose from the dead. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. And then, when the priest gives to the sick person the Holy Eucharist, it is Christ, in his full human and divine reality, who is coming to the sick person, to restore and increase his share in the life of Christ. These are the sacraments of the Church, and there are seven of them. They involve encounters with the living Christ, they are efficacious signs of his grace, perceptible to the senses, in which Christ himself is acting. It's a wonder, a great gift from Christ to his church, the gift of the sacraments. While the sacraments are obviously actions of the church, inasmuch as the church herself is a kind of sacrament of Christ and his action, the seven sacraments are direct actions of Christ who lives constantly in the church as her unseen head. Whenever we approach the sacraments, we ought to do so with a lively faith in his unseen presence, in the unseen presence of the living Jesus in them. The danger is that not seeing the physical form of Jesus, we shall act towards the sacraments in the way we might act towards other things that physically look like them. Let us resolve to cultivate a lively faith in all our contact with the sacraments of the Church, for in them it is Christ whom we meet.